Good evening and welcome to Wild Live for March, just about March, the, the end of March. We've just squeezed this one in, but thank you very much for joining us on what is a lovely summer evening. Uh, but for a fantastically important conversation, a conversation is, we're asking the question tonight, is education failing our young people and the natural world? It seems like a very, very timely question after a year of lockdown when uh, we've, there's been a lot of discussion about children spending a lot of time on screens, but also a lot of discussion about how people have reconnected with the natural world and particularly with nature close to where they live. As we start to think about how we can hopefully head out of lockdown, we need to also be discussing what does that mean for education system in the future? What does that mean for how our education system needs to make sure that young people and support young people uh, are supported to be able to really understand and tackle the climate and nature emergency? Now, this comes in a context where I, for one, feel that the biggest source of hope for me over the last few years has come from young people. You know, over the last five years, say, we've seen young people at the forefront of campaigning and activism to push for bolder action on tackling the climate and ecological emergency. And that's been really fantastic and welcome. But it does raise those questions. Do those young people feel that they're getting what they need from the education system to prepare them for the future? And what are, where are the tantalizing lessons about and the models about how we could do this better if only we could scale them up and share them out so that they're available to everyone? We've got an amazing panel joining us tonight to wrestle with this question, and I'm delighted to introduce them to you. First, we've got Dr. Amir Khan, who will be known to many of you. He's a GP and a GP on television quite often and an ambassador to the Wildlife Trusts. Uh, Amir has also got the amazing credit of he's only the, the only person that's ever been on Wildlife twice. Uh, he's that good that we've brought him back for another run. So Amir, thanks very much. Brilliant you could join us tonight. We've also got Bobby Benjamin-Wand uh, from the London Wildlife Trust. She's a Keeping It Wild project assistant with the London Wildlife Trust. What a brilliant job title. title. And we're going to be hearing about Bobby's work uh, and her first-hand experience as a participant on a project uh, and uh, working through a paid in traineeship in January to March in 2020, and then involved in the Young People's Forum. We've got Niall O'Brien, who's a teacher at the Academy of St. James in Bradford and part of the Wildlife Trust Nature Friendly Schools Network. We've got Joe Brindle, campaigner, who set up Teach the Future, uh, just 18 years old, and uh, or maybe 19 now, Joe, I'll check that, <laughs> I'll check that in a row, uh, but uh, 18, 19 years old, and he has had a gap year really working uh, to set up Teach the Future and make sure that the campaign is there for climate education. And then we have our very own Fiona Groves, who's Education and Learning Policy Manager with the Wildlife Trusts, who uh, looks across all the work we do at the Wildlife Trusts with young people and particularly in education. And she's got a, a strong career history of working in a strategic and advisory role around access to opportunities that develop an understanding of the natural world and our relationship with it. So a great panel uh, to help us wrestle with these questions tonight. And just to start us off, to warm us up, if you like, about what are the issues that we're looking at tonight? We've got a fantastic film, uh, which has been lent to us by Learning Through Landscapes, and it features none other than President Emeritus of the Wildlife Trusts, a certain Sir David Attenborough. Natural spaces are essential for human development and well-being, and none more so than those we set aside for the use of our children. A school playground is a vital space. Now imagine, if you will, five extra classrooms being built on this one, and then add to that 150 more children This is the nature of the problem facing schools today. The hundreds of thousands of additional school places needed to accommodate the growing number of children in this country 
are putting our school grounds under threat. Children need to have contact with nature on a daily basis. Access to open space aids concentration and learning, fuels curiosity, and feeds their natural sense of exploration. But increasingly, our children are living in dense urban conurbations with little or no green space. For many of them, the only contact they get is in their school grounds. But the increase in the number of children is putting this contact at risk as the need to build more classrooms on school grounds increases. Whether they are studying bugs, watching tadpoles, seeing how plants grow or feeling the changes in the seasons, children are learning why nature is important. There is no way of getting away from the need to create extra spaces. But do we have to take away our children's school grounds? There are alternatives. We can use unused buildings in the community. We can timetable greater use of the school grounds, split days. And if we have new school buildings, how can we ensure that what is left gives the biggest and richest outdoor learning experience? If children don't grow up knowing about nature and appreciating it, they will not understand it. And if they don't understand it, they won't protect it. And if they don't protect it, who will? Always good to see Sir David at work, isn't it? Anyway, let's hear first uh, from Dr. Amir Khan. Amir, can you tell us just how important is outdoor learning, do you think, for the health and well-being of young people? Hi, hi, Craig. Hi, everyone. Yes, I, I certainly can. Outdoor learning is, is hugely important, not just in terms of a learning activity, because we know when children spend time outdoors learning, it does actually improve their concentration indoors for quite some time after that period that they've been outdoors. That's been proven in studies. But there are immense health benefits as, uh, uh, as well. So uh, children can be grouped into different categories, really, from age, age ranges to abilities. Uh, it doesn't matter how you group them, but, but when, you, when you put them outdoors, uh, like I say, the concentration level increases. They're more likely to be active, which will be really good for their weight and cardiovascular health, which is something, as a, as a doctor, I'm really concerned about with young people, particularly because of, of lockdown and time spent on screens. Um, and people with children with learning difficulties, actually, who, who may well spend the least time outdoors, stand to benefit the most from, from spending time outdoors. That's from an emotional point of view, from a psychological point of view, from a well-being point of view. All of these things have been greatly um, proven in, in, in studies, like, like I say. Uh, and actually, people with other, uh, uh, children with other conditions, things like uh, attention defi deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, they've all been shown actually when they spend more time outdoors that their symptoms from those conditions particularly ADHD uh, do, does actually uh, improve and their hyperactivity levels decrease after spending time outdoors as well so the the health benefits are are huge and when they're outdoors of course they'll be connecting with nature uh, understanding the benefits of nature uh, which will hopefully uh, go on uh, to form that kind of connection and relationship we want which will foster them to then uh, want to conserve it in the future Sorry, Amir, what would you think are some of the best examples you've seen of this? 
So like Niall, I, I work in Bradford. I grew up in Bradford. Uh, and um, as much as anything, you know, kids or, or young people who who um, don't have that access to nature, who don't have, who, 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 who might live uh, in inner city areas, particularly socially deprived inner city areas, um, uh, again, stand, stand to benefit the most. So when I go out to schools and I do go out to schools and I talk about the benefits of nature and we go outdoors you can see that effect quite immediately but i've visited schools as you know in hull uh who have adopted uh, uh an allotment and have started growing vegetables but in an organic way studying the insects that come and uh, uh visit there and that and, and their relationship with nature when i compare that to schools that don't have facilities like that who may not have green spaces uh, that they have access to um that the knowledge the relationship with nature the health benefits that those children get are very very apparent compared to the to to those who don't have it one thing i'm really 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 keen on is all about access to nature and and i think children from all backgrounds uh, uh from all abilities should be able to access nature equally because there is so much to benefit from it and it's not right that some kids get that benefit and 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 others don't uh so what i want to see as part of nature in the curriculum is access to nature for all children and Amir, do you think the realisation, the understanding of this has grown over the last year during the pandemic or not? Yeah, I think certainly in the first wave of the pandemic, you know, when it was all new to us, when the only thing we could do was get outside, uh, uh, people really did connect with nature there. And uh, children did in a way, but children can't articulate it in the same way that adults can. I think parents have certainly seen the effects of uh, all this screen time on children's uh, concentration on their behaviour as well. And they've probably noticed what it's like not to be able not just to socially interact at schools, but those social interactions that take place outdoors as well, which are hugely important in, in child development. Uh, and that's all been missing. So I think, yes, I think we have really connected with nature uh, in this pandemic. I think we've connected with green spaces more, particularly in that first lockdown. I think it's important that we hold on to those feelings because already I feel them ebbing away uh, slightly as people want to do other things like go back to restaurants and non-nature related activity. Uh, but I, I, I do think there is a, a more of an appreciation for time spent in nature. But the key now is for us to harness that appreciation before it ebbs away. Great. Well, Amir, thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you in a little bit. But let's go on now to hear from Joe Brindle, who, as I said earlier, actually set up, founded Teach the Future while studying for his A-levels, which is pretty impressive, isn't it? Joe, tell us about this. Tell us about setting up Teach the Future. Why did you do it and, and what is it? Yeah, so Teach the Future, it's a campaign pushing for better um, climate and environmental education. Uh, it started back in like the end of 2019. And at that point, it was just me. But um, after a, a bit of work, we've grown to about like 60 young volunteers. And we've got some student members of staff on our team who are working to campaign. That's what I've been doing for the last year during my gap year. Um, so this all kind of started because I was getting close to the end of my time at like kind of like the was it mandatory form education? So when you when you turn um, eighteen, and um, I had realised that despite generally good education, I've been you know, I've been to a good school. Um, my teachers are really good. I've been taught very little about climate change, and um, what I had been taught, like often, I had to push for, and sometimes it wasn't always that like high quality teaching. Often, like outdated resources that weren't really like kind of the up to date science and that kind of thing. And this was despite the fact that I took uh, like biology, chemistry and history at A-level. So all subjects with kind of clear links to environment, natural world and climate change. And I, yeah, really just a small handful of lessons on it. And this is this is quite shocking for me because I kind of left education actually knowing very little about climate change. I, I went on, I can't remember, I think I watched a, a, a Greta Thunberg speech and that really inspired me and shocked me because I was like, how on earth have I not been told about this? How have I not been taught about this? It was like a real, like, real, like, kind of like shocking and, and kind of like action inspiring moment. And 
and that, that's that's why I started Teach the Future. I think it's really important that 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 every young person is taught to understand climate change because we're growing up in a world that's going to be really greatly affected by it. And and if we're given a really good understanding of how climate change is going to affect our lives, then hopefully we can do as much as we can to try and kind of, I guess, minimize its effects and adapt to them. But also if we're taught about how we can contribute to the solutions, then I think we'll be able to create a much better, more sustainable world through education. Great, Joe. Well, it's incredibly impressive that you uh, were able to do this. And uh, as I understand it, it's, it's also been joined part of Students Organising Sustainability, isn't it? That's a wider sort of network. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so we've got like a huge number of support organisations. One of those is Students Organising Sustainability. They've kind of been hosting the campaign. Um, so it's a group that it's kind of a sustainability organisation that came out of the National Union of Students. Um, and it's kind of showing how much appetite there is from students to do this. Um, we've uh, had both the last two National Union Student Presidents have, have joined us in our speeches and our events because it's really important to students at university and secondary school that this happens. In Teachers Future we're asking that um, every kind of student is taught about climate change not just like in isolated subjects so currently it's taught in optional geography and a little bit in science. As I say I took biology and chemistry at level wasn't taught much about it. What we instead want to see is climate change and sustainability and the environment, particularly sustainability as a principle, to be key across all of the curriculum, across all subject areas, so that all students can get a chance to really explore it and understand it and understand the kind of really kind of intrinsic links between the natural world and everything else we do. And we're hoping that this will mean that whatever kind of job, uh, whatever kind of, you know, wherever you live, whatever job you do, you're still going to be able to take the things that you've learned from school about the natural world and about climate change into your adult lives so that every job can become a green job is the general idea. And I think that, needs, that can only happen if every subject becomes a green subject as well. If we're taught about climate change in all of them, you know, for example, in uh, design technology, we could learn about sustainable materials. In languages, we can cover, you know, talking about environmental issues. In English, we can look at, you know, literature from people that have suffered from the effects of climate change and that way it will give us a really good and an understanding of climate change and sustainability so we can then go on to kind of contribute to the solutions of fighting those great well joe it's really impressive you've done this and i i, I have to ask what would you say maybe i've i've uh, i don't want this to sound too much like a job interview but <laughs> i'm fascinated to know what have you uh, what have you learned most over this last year of setting that up i mean it's uh, it, it must be a huge learning curve and what surprised you yeah, I mean, I think one of my probably the biggest learning for me is a bit of a general one, but young people have a lot of power. It's been amazing to see how much we've been able to achieve. Like in the last year, um, I've been involved in, I mean, they had the climate strikes in 2019, which is, you know, immensely powerful and amazing thing to be leading. And then we've had the, um, I mean, you know, lots of young people involved in the Black Lives Matter movement at the beginning of last year. We've had um, the protests that led to the cancellation of the kind of exam grading system. All of these amazing things that young people have been able to do despite the pandemic and despite all of the other things they've got going on, despite school and stuff. It's been really amazing. And kind of, honestly, my, my number one learning is just, wow, young people have an amazing power um, if we, you know, use it well. And, and that's just been really inspiring to see all the young people just doing amazing things and Teach the Future and other organisations you've worked with. Fantastic. Well, well, I completely agree with that. And um, I said it before, but I'm going to say it again, definitely. Uh, what your generation has been doing these last five years has given me amazing hope and inspiration. Uh, after years of campaigning myself, you know, actually to see what you've done the last uh, five years or so, your generation has been really inspiring and, and given us all a boost. So thank you very much for that. We've got great comments coming in. Uh, Jen Hurst has said, uh, let's have more youth voice and real decision making in all our organizations. Jen, I completely agree. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that many of uh, local wildlife trusts have now got youth representatives on their boards and many more plan to. And we're looking at that nationally as well. Uh, but it's an incredibly important thing to do. And 
you know, as Joe was saying, um, uh, young people do have power and uh, I think they should have more power as well. So let's let's make sure we do that. Dawn Preston has said this is the vital point. Oh, I wonder what point she was making. Uh, <laughs> what that was on access to good quality greed space for all is critically important. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go here shortly from Bobby Benjamin Ward from Lon Wand from London Wildlife Trust. But first of all, let's see a video from Bobby from London Wildlife Trust about the, the amazing project, Keeping It Wild. My favourite wild place in London is Woodby Wetlands because it's hidden in the heart of Manor House and you've never been there. I think young people should get involved in keeping it wild because it means they can have an impact on their local area. It's important for young people to be taking the lead alongside the adults for the environment. It's a great way to meet like-minded people, share some ideas, learn some new things. The Keeping It Wild project is unique because it brings people together from all different types of backgrounds. The environment doesn't just belong to one person, it belongs to everybody. And therefore everyone should get in a say of how to protect it. Well, isn't that inspiring? Fantastic to see that project from London Wildlife Trust. So now let's meet Bobby Benjamin Wand. Uh, Bobby, it just looks like an amazing project. It really was. Um, so I'm there. Um, I work for London Wildlife Trust and it's the only charity that is solely focused on protecting London's wildlife. Um, and currently I'm the project assistant for Keeping It Wild, which is an ambitious project that aims to connect young Londoners to the natural world on their doorstep. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the Keeping It Wild project, my journey on the project and also my experience um, in delivering informal education and formal education to young people um, aged 11 to 25 and young children. Uh, so since autumn of 2018, London Wildlife Trust has delivered Keeping It Wild, which is a youth engagement project supported by grant funding from the National Heritage Lottery Fund's Kick the Dust programme. Um, and this aims to test different ways of making heritage more accessible to young people. Over the three years, we aim to engage 600 young people aged 11 to 25 to become actively involved in the protection and promotion of London's nature and green spaces. And the project focuses on young people who are typically underrepresented and underserved in the environmental sector. Um, so these are these include young people from areas of social economic deprivation, young people from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and people with disabilities. Keeping it wild has sought to increase diversity and inclusion amongst young people engaging with nature through a range of opportunities, including hands on conservation taster days, skills development programs, social action projects um, with mini grant schemes, um, also paid, paid traineeships, which I was involved in, and a young people's forum, which I was also involved in. Um, so my experience on the project was from January of 2020 to April of 2020, I was a full time paid trainee for three months. And this was an amazing experience as I learned about species and habitats in the city I'd grown up in, but I knew very little about. And from the traineeship, I feel like a whole new wildlife world has opened up to me. And after my traineeship um, ended, I joined the Young People's Forum. So that was from April of 2020 to August of 2020. And this was a group of 15 to 20 young people that would meet throughout the year for training um, and sharing ideas to help and shape uh, the Keeping It Wild project. And then after that, in September, I began my full-time role as a Keeping It Wild project assistant. And this is my first ever career-focused job. So during this time, I've gained experience in many different areas, um, including online project delivery to young people aged 11 to 25 and workshop, workshop facilitation. Um, and during my time as a trainee and project assistant, the importance of environmental education for children and young people has been made apparent to me continuously. In regards to formal education, I had the privilege of assisting and leading uh, sessions with children aged five to six uh, 
years of age as a trainee. And these school sessions are so important in connecting young people from all backgrounds to wildlife and are especially important in giving some of these children their first experiences in nature. The young children I work with really enjoyed exploring the nature reserves and discovering wildlife, as well as answering questions around topics they'd learned in the classroom. And it was really lovely seeing the sense of wonderment from both children and the teachers. I also discovered um, informal education for young people was so beneficial. And here's some of the examples that I found um, while doing my work. So I found that young people had an improvement in mental health and well-being during our Wild Action Programme evening sessions over six weeks. The young people were given mindfulness tasks to complete um, each week and they would come back surprised at how spending time in nature can make them feel relaxed and less anxious. And these sessions also offer a safe space for the young people to learn in a relaxed way and to socialise with other young people, um, which many had said had really helped them through the challenging lockdown period. Young people have gained a range of skills, so youth groups that receive funding to create their social action projects, which are environmentally focused, and made some really amazing and creative campaigns that have not only benefited but improved the young people's skills in creativity, project management, ecology and leadership, and young people also possess um, a real sense of... Um, accomplishment. So during practical conservation sessions with young people, we found that they felt a real sense of achievement by seeing the positive impact they've made um, on the environment and something which is really important for nurturing and building confidence in the amazing young people of today. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> it's just such a brilliant project. I've got to ask you the same question. What, what would you say surprised you most over, over that period of time? Or indeed, what was the biggest learning for you personally? I think how much nature was in London, because I come from London, I was born here, um, and I didn't know about London Wildlife Trust sites. I didn't know half of the species that were actually in London. I didn't realise how rich and diverse uh, the wildlife was on my doorstep. Yeah, there's so much to discover, isn't there, when you get into it. And uh, actually, London is an extraordinary city for wildlife, uh, you know, when you sort of lift the veil on that. And I think London Wildlife Trust doing a great job in, in revealing that. So it's a really inspiring project. So uh, thanks so much, Bobby, and thanks so much for all the comments coming in from you tonight. We've had uh, Prue Reynolds who's saying sustainability across the world would bring in a much broader global curriculum and in all the inequalities that exist. Uh, Kat Woolley said uh, about keeping it wild, you'll be pleased to know, uh, Bobby, love it, need more of these projects. <laughs> Absolutely right, people are uh, loving it out there. Thanks so much, keep the comments uh, coming in. So let's hear now from Niall O'Brien, who's a teacher at the Academy at of St. James in Bradford, who's part of the Wildlife Trust Nature Friendly Schools project. And uh, now tell us about your work and uh, talk about how you're integrating outdoor learning into your own school. Yeah, so um, I think first of all, it's important to uh, say that it's it's great to listen, listen to Dr. Tommy, obviously being from Bradford as well and, and talking about the importance of learning outside the classroom. It seems that we're definitely on the right track in terms of the, the things he's mentioned, you know, what's, what should be a priority for our young people. I think at our school, first of all, we've, we've got an excellent offer. Well, I, I personally think it's excellent. We uh, dedicate a huge amount of time to forest schools. Um, we have sort of five hours a week dedicated to it. So that's sort of five identified groups. So again, we'll look at our, our most vulnerable children. We'll look at our children that we feel will benefit the most. Obviously, we want all our children to access our outdoor space, but Fundamentally, we're, we're using our outdoor learning to, you know, to support those children that, that need it the most, whether that be communication, social skills, you know, just self-regulating in terms of behaviour, and and more importantly, self-esteem and confidence. Um, you know, it, that that's absolutely vital for the pupils in our community within Bradford. Um, a couple of things I'd like to mention that we're also incredibly proud of. Um, we've got a fantastic link with a parent volunteer who has um, built us by hand an outdoor classroom which is situated by our nature reserve that's on site. Um, it's been great to obviously link with nature friendly schools because we're, we're able to tap into environmental scientists and lots of support to kind of look at developing that area. But um, as I say, the parent who has um, created this incredible space, it's almost finished. We're actually after somebody to open it. So I think there could be someone on the panel this evening that might open it for us. Um, but yeah, next to our nature reserve and our outdoor classroom, We've got um, we've got a brand new, just recently installed uh, fire pit reading area. So we're hoping to bring more more groups outside. 
um, to, to enjoy our space. We, we've got a lovely site. We're very fortunate, obviously. We're still in the middle of Bradford, but we'll have an area, um, Pitty Beck and the wetlands just beyond our school. Um, I've never been so excited to install a gate in our school, which gives us uh, direct access to Pitty Beck and, and wetlands so we can uh, go, and, go and enjoy the new space, uh, the newly developed space down there. We've we're very lucky again to have incredible wildlife for our children, the deer, you know, various sort of native British birds. Um, we invested in some binoculars through nature friendly schools. And again, I, I, was, I was so surprised, you know, that the children absolutely adore using the binoculars. And it's something that we've embedded into our physically active enrichment offer, which is something that I think kind of sets our school apart. Um, we dedicate a, a whole school approach on a Friday afternoon. Every single class um, is outside. And uh, most of the activities are, you know, within nature itself. We have um, a nature walk on the school site, nature photography. As I say, within our forest school session, we offer them building fire lighting, school use, um, picture orienteering on the site. It's a, it's a fantastic offer. We've recently had BBT come in to, to have a look at that. And um, it was just wonderful to see our children responding so well um, outside and, and just enjoying our space. Um, I think something else that really important to mention, and it was difficult kind of about COVID, but just before we thought not only do we want to sort of enjoy our own um, green space, it's important that our children get to, you know, explore and experience our local green spaces. As I said before, we're incredibly fortunate, fortunate in terms of where we're situated. And, you know, hopefully our trust will shortly let us back out on our minibus so we can take groups weekly out to our our local green space is for our children to kind of really appreciate those areas that they might not get the opportunity to visit with their family. Um, yeah, so I think when I look at our work with Nature Friendly Schools, it's just amazing to be able to tap into expertise and support because as a school, I'm just one individual that's trying to obviously encourage the rest of our members of staff to, to take the learning outside and and we're slowly but surely developing an offer that's, as I say, something to be proud of. And I can see that we've got key stage leaders, both in key stage one and key stage two, that are taking their learning outdoors. And hopefully the gates that we've just installed down to our beautiful green space at Pitty Beck, that will just be a catalyst to hopefully inspire our teachers to take, you know, whatever subject that may be, whether it be geography or science or, or, or the core subjects. It's just something I'm looking forward to uh, seeing sort of flourish in the, in the coming months. Great. Niall, thank you very much. It just sounds amazing. I love your, love your description of that gate. It sounds so enticing. <laughs> it really does. Uh, Niall, can you tell us a little bit more, but in a very practical sense, how being part of a project like Nature Friendly Schools, how has it helped you as a teacher sort of build the confidence and skills needed to deliver outdoor learning? Yeah, I think it's important. I've not mentioned there, we've... Um, Within the, the project with Nature Friendly Schools, we've been um, able to access um, lots of amazing training through Young Minds. So looking at academic resilience, looking at taking the curriculum outside. And sometimes it's difficult as, a, as one individual to sort of change the culture, I guess, in a school. But we've been able to, you know, allow many different uh, members of staff to access this training. I think when you get somebody such as myself um, that's accessing it, that's just one person. But... We've got, we've had teachers accessing the training. We've had, we've had our mentors accessing training. I think that's been huge because our, our mentors, obviously their, their sole responsibility in school is looking at the mental health and wellbeing of our pupils. So being able to draw them in and it's almost uh, spreading the message and sort of a, a ripple effect across our staffing team. And uh, yeah, I think that, that's been important alongside the more practical nature. Um, it's interesting because we've just recently sort of start to develop a loose parts play area. Now, this is very much kind of, I would say, an early years approach. Um, yeah, most of it is natural material or, or things that we've managed to, again, engage parents and parents have donated items such as tyres and crates and ropes. Um, but it's been really, really interesting to see that our key stage two pupils, you know, that are almost ready for high school, are engaging and immersing themselves in outdoor play in our natural space uh, at the same level as, you know, children in the early years. So... That, that's been something that's uh, kind of caught my eye and we're looking to develop further and get more support through nature-friendly schools. 
Great. Okay. And let me ask you this. Why, why would you say, why is outdoor learning not more widely available despite the clear benefits, would you say? And then I'll, I'll sort of come to Amir and ask him the same thing, you know, because uh, I, I know Amir's got to go before too long, but I'd love to know, first of all, for you, Nia, what, what, why does it feel like it's not more widely available despite the clear benefits? I believe it's, it's probably confidence of staff. And I think you can go back mm. to initial teacher training. Um, I've obviously listened to colleagues so far. And, you know, there are elements that are missed out. Um, I think certainly confidence, competence, and I think it boils down to well, boils down to risk. You know, teachers, support staff may not be confident to, you know, allow children to explore and, you know, be in a situation where there is risk. But, you know, it's, it's probably my job and, you know, other advocates to sort of engage those people who are unsure. And, you know, it's that risk-benefit analysis, how much benefit are our children getting? in comparison to the risk. So I would definitely say it, it's training and, and, and confidence. Great. Well, I have to tell you, um, Emma in London has said, lucky children at your school, Niall. It sounds like a wonderful place to grow up. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, people are uh, loving this, hearing about your description there. Emir, what is your sense of it? Why, you know, it's, it's it seems like such a no-brainer, doesn't it? It just seems ridiculous that we're even having to sort of discuss this tonight and so on. What, what do you think have been the big blocks here? What, why is this yeah. not a bigger thing? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say, Niall, you're making me proud to be from Bradford. That stuff sounds amazing. I'd love to come visit. Uh, I'm just round the corner from you, so we've got to make it happen. Um, now... I think traditionally all of this uh, nature friendly schools is so, so important, but traditionally this is all new stuff in the curriculum and these schools, you know, the schools have been there for quite some time. A lot of the buildings have been in their situations for quite some time and nature wasn't incorporated into the curriculum when these schools were built. So a lot of them won't have green spaces around them. Certainly I have a school uh, just opposite the surgery I work at and there is no green space. There's a main road and there's a paved playground. That is it. Uh, and for, for, for we know now that nature is, is really beneficial to learning, but, but, but it wasn't really thought about back then uh, when these schools were put together. And now getting children to green spaces, particularly inner city children, if it's not via buses and cars, teachers do have to walk them there themselves. And now we'll know more about this than me, but that can be quite hazardous. And like I said, there's, there's, there's risks involved to taking large groups of children out on foot, crossing main roads and that kind of thing. Uh, so it, it's almost like an afterthought once everything was put in place. And then we go, actually, now we know green spaces work for education, they work for health. How are we going to kind of shoehorn that in? So, what, and this goes back to what I was saying before, really, we need to bring these green spaces to the schools, to the inner city areas. So these children don't have to travel to get anywhere uh, uh, where that involves a, a green space. I think that's that's really important. That magic gate that Niall's talking about there, I think every school should have one. <laughs> it does sound absolutely amazing. <laughs> Suzanne, the comments are really coming in thick and fast now. Thank you very much. Suzanne says of your school, Niall, how, you're how <laughs> wonderfully inspiring. However, it demonstrates that too often it's down to an individual teacher who might have an interest in wildlife rather than education policy in place. Josie Fitz says, I think if you uh, learned indoors and have been taught to be a teacher indoors, it takes a lot of confidence to bring your teaching outdoors. Dawn Prestoner says, wonderful to hear more children and young people being given the opportunity, space and time to play. And then Gemma Goldenberg, I'll put this to you, Amir. This work is more important than ever post-COVID. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. So important. Uh, so important. So, so um, nature, being outdoors in nature, you know, what, what we've known about through COVID is how underlying health conditions, obesity, uh, uh, affect your uh, ability to survive certain things, and COVID being one of them. When people spend more time outdoors, their risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, even things like Alzheimer's, dementia, all of this goes down. Uh, and that's simply just from spending time outdoors, being active outdoors, engaging in activities and engaging your brain with outdoor uh, activities. So it's a, it, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a pun, it's, it's a no brainer, really. We've got to get people out there, uh, improve their health, uh, which will have long-term 
benefits. And, you know, we, we can talk about the pandemic as much and, and that the way it started in our relationship with nature in that regard as well. But, you know, we, we have got to improve all of that because that highlights how uh, a poor relationship uh, with nature can lead to untold health hazards. You know, we've just lived through it. We're still living through a year of it. Uh, and, and so it, it, everything goes full circle. It all links back to a good relationship with nature, good health for us, good health outcomes for us. And eventually that will uh, make us, uh, and humans are very, very selfish, aren't they? If things benefit us, that's where we'll help it. And nature benefits us. Uh, and so we've got to help it. And that's why we want these young people to engage in. Mm. And um, what's been the reaction of parents, Niall? I'm, I'm just interested to hear that. I mean, is it has it been wholly supportive or sometimes there have been some that are a bit questioning and not not quite sure? No, I think that we're, we're quite um, we're quite busy on Twitter um, and and we have a, another social media platform just for parents, which is Class Dojo. And every time we celebrate anything in the outdoors, it gets a lot of traffic. Um, and it, again, I think... Anytime we're kind of after some donations or we're talking about our plans going forward, particularly with the, the outdoor classroom, so many parents were eager to to join in to, to obviously support. They couldn't due to COVID, which was a real shame. But um, my words, there will be further opportunities in the future because that's what we want. We want our school to be a, a, a beacon of you know good practice in the outdoors. We want to share our facility. We want it to be. Um, you know a community site so it can be used in the school holidays it can be used in the evening it's not just for our our pupils we want families to to be able to access it as well and we, we feel like we're well on our way to that great okay well look uh i emir i know you've got to go very soon so uh because you've got a consultation with a patient um but I just ask you a final question because I, I'm sure Boris Johnson and Gavin Williamson are watching tonight. They always tune into Wildlife. And um, so what, how would you sum it up? What would be the message you would pass to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for Education at this precise moment? Oh, you're mute, sorry, man. You'd think I'd have learned this by now. Right, so uh, what I would say to uh, to Gavin Williamson is is forest schools, there's so much evidence behind it. Learning in nature, there's so much evidence uh, uh, behind it. And our children deserve that. Every child in the UK deserves access to green spaces, not just uh, for social activities, but for education as well. And, and what I would say to Boris Johnson is, and I'll, I'll try not to be too controversial, what I will say to Boris Johnson is, um, you know, we have read all the recommendations. We have read all the evidence. What we need is action now. You know, it, it, having report after report after report, recommendation after recommendation after recommendation. We've, we've had enough of that. We know what the evidence is. We need action. Great. Thank you. Well, um, we'll try and t tweet that clip of you saying that to him in the next few days. <laughs> that works. Amir, uh, I know you've got to go. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate Cheers. it. And, and as ever, really appreciate you being an ambassador for the Wildlife Trust. Thanks. Oh, it's my pleasure completely. Thanks, guys. See you. Take Bye -bye. care. So uh, let's move it on. And uh, we've got a fantastic video now featuring Charlotte Willoughby, a teacher at um, uh, Woodson Infant School uh, in Guildford, really talking us through how, taking, how to take learning beyond the classroom and her experiences of doing that. Hi, my name's Charlotte Willoughby. I'm Deputy Head and full-time teacher at Wood Street Infant School in Guildford in Surrey. I've been teaching for well over 10 years now and in all honesty, I could not imagine doing my job without teaching outside. Outdoor learning is a huge part of our curriculum at Wood Street. It's been something that we've worked on really hard over the last five years. Uh, it's part of our everyday practice, um, as well as an enrichment um, for our curriculum. We go outside as much as we can. We offer woodland school sessions. We have bespoke outdoor areas for both our early years and our Key Stage 1 classrooms. Um, and in all honesty, we do as much as we can out in our local environment um, and in our school grounds. We regularly go off site to our local woodland area. All children have access to an outdoor space where they can play, make, explore and get muddy. 
We also value practical skills such as woodwork, which we do outside. For us at Wood Street, getting outside means getting in touch with nature, exploring, having fun, taking risks, working together. There are so many benefits. And in light of COVID, being outside, in nature, in the environment, it's a safe place to be. And it's something that I think we probably took for granted. Although our school grounds are concrete, we found ways to grow. We care for and harvest from our school garden and use it to cook in our kitchen. So much of our curriculum can be covered by teaching outside, exploring and playing the way that children learn their best. So I could not advocate outdoor learning anymore. Isn't that yet another inspiring video about just what can be done in this area when we put our minds to it? And as I said, as I keep saying all night, you know, it just seems so obvious that we need to be doing this. But let's hear now from Fiona Groves, who's Education and Learning Policy Manager at the Wildlife Trust. And Fiona, tell us a bit more about the work the Wildlife Trust does in this area. And of course, also, what are the policy asks we're asking the government for here? OK, thank you, Craig. I think, uh, firstly, I just want to build on something that, that's been mentioned all the way through, which is about sort of developing skills and confidence. And I, I started my career as a, an education ranger in Sherwood Forest at, at the right old age of 23. And uh, what I discovered on my, my second day at work is that having a biology degree was actually no good at all. Um, I needed more skills. Uh, I needed know-how in uh, sort of making connections with the natural world. I needed to know how to bring in really big concepts um, to small details. And I just wanted to pick that up because um, at the Wildlife Trust, we work across the UK. We've got 46 Wildlife Trusts. Uh, and every day, uh, our staff and our experts are engaging with uh, children and young people doing many, many different things. And I wish I'd had access to some of that know-how uh, at that uh, ripe old age of 23 myself. So over, over the trust, as well as the projects like Nature Friendly Schools, we have got other programmes. We've got a massive uh, youth programme called Our Bright Future, which is engaging uh, young people of 18 to 24 year olds um, in getting more say, if you like. But we've also got things like care farms, we've got um, observ observatories on reserves where, where children and young people can go and watch uh, beetles and bees and birds. Um, we're working with refugees uh, in deprived areas. We're, we've got beach schools, we've got forest schools, we've got so much happening over the UK. Um, and so the expertise is there. And I think uh, one of the things that we know is that schools and some teachers and children and young people find it difficult to access some of these things if they haven't got the right confidence, they've not got the right skills and they, they don't actually know how to, to access. So I was pleased when um, Charlotte um, said in the film about this is a way to COVID recovery um, because I agree that nature recovery and COVID recovery could now go hand in hand. And it's what we're looking for at, at the Wildlife Trust, really. A fundamental um, shift, if you like, in, in our education so that um, children, young people and adults as well can, uh, if you like, have a, a natural learning journey that can occur at any age or any stage. So as well as so learning in nature, outdoor learning, uh, learning about nature is really, really important. And we want to see that to be commonplace in curricula, integrated and across every age and stage. And we also want to see learning through nature to be much more accessible. So on the doorstep where we live, where we work and where we play. So our, our big asks really for, for education is around this integration so that we can give everybody the skills that they need. And when, when we say everybody, it do mean teachers, but also the young people, and also governors, school leaders, parents and carers, so that we can really get this whole school 
whole education uh, approach. And we can't do it on our own either. So to get action for nature uh, in the way that we want, um, we actually do need to work in collaboration with, with communities uh, around, around our countries. And we need more than anything a government to recognise the importance of this being integrated. So they're, they're the things we want to see. I think we've got um, a, a great opportunity at the moment. So rather than returning to school with coats on, with the windows open to get that safe ventilation for COVID, why don't we just start right now and take all, all lessons as outdoors as much as possible? Great, Fiona. Thank you very much. Um, but what about money? Let me ask you about that. What about the, the funding for this? I mean, how, how good has the funding been to date? Is it what's required? Is new funding required to enable this to happen? And, and what sort of scale are we looking at? So that's a really good question, Craig. Um, there's, there's been a lot of mention of Nature Family Schools, one of our, one of our projects, but it is a, a time-bound funded project. And this is one of, one of the challenges really, is how we get that thread through over time uh, for um, being in, uh, learning about our natural world and also uh, having access to those spaces and places. How do we get that over time when programs and projects are only two, three or five years long? Um, and often those are funded by uh, other agencies so uh, the findings and learnings from nature friendly schools are gonna be absolutely vital because it has had some core funding. It's not a lot to see the massive impacts as, as Nile has shown uh, and could get us out quite easily. Um, but it does need governments, and I say governments because we're talking about UK governments, uh, they need to take this more seriously and put the funding in so that we can have long-term change so that nature can benefit, but also education can work and benefit along with it. So when you say governments there, you mean in, in the different devolved parts of the UK as well? So in, yeah. Yeah, so the UK government, but also the Welsh, Scottish, Northern Ireland, yeah. Yeah, and, and actually um, track record in some of the devolved governments, uh, Scotland and Wales in particular, have been a little bit more supportive uh, in integrating some, um, even if it's just guidance, you know, they were really early uh, last year to come out with guidance for early years getting outside, uh, in Scotland in particular. So um, I think if some of those devolved governments could work together as well and, and really look at how this is sort of key to get it integrated in our curricula, in our education settings uh, and right across the board. Well, when you're saying on the funding thing there, then it needs to be, I mean, obviously it needs to be scaled up, but you just want to end the stop start at nature of it, really, to move beyond project to make it make it core. Yeah, okay, great. Joe, um, in the work you did uh, with Teach the Future, wh where did you kind of get to in terms of your policy asks? What would you say are the big things that you think, are, after looking at it, you think are needed to, to scale up outdoor learning? Yeah, that's a good question. So obviously it differs a bit between each, um, each nation in the UK because um, education is devolved. Um, but generally what we need is the introduction of a new, a new, an, a new act, uh, a, climate, a, a Climate Emergency Education Act is what we're calling it, that would make sure or would make it essential that climate change is taught about at every education institution. And that means primary schools, secondary schools, uh, climate change in nature, I should say primary schools, secondary schools, universities, colleges, everything. Um, but then importantly, to enable that to happen, we need to make sure that the teachers are being trained on climate change and sustainability and environment. We did some recent research and it found that 70% um, of teachers say they feel they haven't received adequate training to teach on climate change. So like almost three quarters of teachers haven't received enough training on it. Um, and 41% of teachers say climate change is rarely or never mentioned in their schools, which is really, really shocking. There's a huge, huge issue, which is really, really important, needs to be talked about and talked about much, much more. So we need to make sure teachers are trained. Um, we also need to change, I think, um, kind of like vocational courses, uh, courses that kind of train you up for jobs to make sure the skills you're being given are, are green skills, skills that can help us make the world more sustainable. Um, rather than skills which are continuing to kind of 
perpetuate unsustainability. And finally, we need to transform our school buildings and school environments so that they are carbon uh, neutral um, and amazing biodiverse places, um, which can be used for, school, for students to really explore nature within their schools and around their schools. Um, I mean, like a lot of schools are getting solar panels on their roofs, which is a great first step, but we need to be doing seeing so much more. And I think the big issue of government funding there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but and um, Bobby, let me come back to you. Marina Robb has said uh, of you, amazing young woman, after you're speaking, you'll be delighted to know, Bobby. Uh, and I want to put a question to you uh, from Finley Hutchinson. It says, as a young person who's in year 12, I see daily how disconnected children are to nature. A lot of that, I believe, is down to it being uncool. How can we remove the negative stigma associated with nature? What do you reckon, Bobby? So um, a lot of Keeping It Wild, um, a lot of the project is working with kind of like media and journalism. And I actually did like an OCN accreditation in media and journalism with a focus on the environment. And it was really amazing because I feel like young people are very kind of consumed by social media and their phones and they're quite creative. And it was a kind of amalgamation of the environment and using your creativity to kind of spread the word. Um, so we've, as as like Keeping It Wild, we've tried to um, kind of like steer the communications of London Wildlife Trust to try and engage a lot more, a lot, um, a lot more of a diverse and younger kind of audience and showing young people kind of like yourself actually going out exploring nature and um, getting involved in conservation it is really fun and can be cool <laughs> great uh we had a comment from claire skidmore says i recently moved to sheffield hope to find a local nature club for my seven-year-old outside school However, I haven't found anything. I would volunteer to run something, but not sure how. So, Claire, let me say, I, I think you should give um, give Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust a shout. I'm sure they'd be delighted to uh, reach out to you and, and uh, see how they can help. So, Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust, uh, look at their website, see uh, what they might be able to do to help. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Uh, Chris Tolson has said, uh, we have been working with Nature Friendly Schools for a year. And learning outdoors is having a huge impact on our children every day. I'm really proud of the work Niall is doing. So there's a lot of love for the panel coming in here tonight, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, question for you, Fiona. Uh, Chris Hammersley says, are Wildlife Trust Reserves making spaces for schools to use as classrooms? And we have, uh, I'll give you my favourite statistic that I give at every wildlife. The Wildlife Trust, we have more nature reserves than McDonald's has restaurants in the UK. <laughs> A thousand more. Um, so I've got to get that out. Fiona, so are we using our wildlife trust reserves to make spaces for schools to use as classrooms? Yeah, I think uh, we do have education uh, activities going on at many, many of our reserves. Some, um, some trusts have dedicated buildings, classrooms that are a springboard, if you like, for going out into the reserves. And some trusts actually deliver um, programs and activities in smaller reserves, some that aren't um, openly accessible to all the public, um, whether that's near schools or in communities. Um, but the other thing to say is a, a lot of our staff are also um, delivering, if you like, in community settings, and they're delivering on behalf of the local authority, if you like, on some programs at, uh, in targeted places. So yeah, our, our, our staff are, are everywhere helping with that. Um, obviously, uh, some schools and some teachers are taking their own classes and, and doing what they can on those reserves that are open as well. So yeah, a real, really big uh, mixed picture. And, and I've just been absolutely uh, in awe of the range and scope of activity that goes on uh, at nature reserves and, and wildlife just across the, the country. It's just uh, phenomenal, really. Great, Fiona, thank you. Niall, there's a whole plethora of questions for you you'll be delighted to know. Um, Prue Reynolds has asked, are you able to get the parents involved as well and monitor the impact on their mental well-being? And while you're at it, how about this question from Roberta in Italy? Did you notice any positive effects on teachers as well as on children? Niall. 
Yeah, first of all, in terms of parents, um, just before I arrived at the school um, down by the our nature reserve, um, we had parent volunteers in. They were more than happy to, to come down and move the timbers in. They started to build our raised beds, uh, planters, um, a ramp down into the nature reserve and some steps. But obviously, um, since then, that's kind of come to a halt. Um, what was the second question? Sorry. Uh, and have you noticed any positive effects on the on mental health of teachers and uh, you know how you felt you and other teachers have felt in this and indeed uh, perhaps parents if parents are getting involved do you think it sort of helps their well-being as well? Yeah certainly in terms of teachers um, as I say our, our offer is pretty significant in terms of time spent outside whether that be physical education our active enrichment or our, our forest school work um, I think obviously some of our pupils were off for such a long time and as were members of staff. So I think coming back to school, probably in lockdown too, if my memory serves me well, um, I, I think our support staff and our teachers were inspired to be outside. And I think that was largely based on the reaction of our children because they are a resilient bunch. Uh, children all over the country don't quite think we give them the credit sometimes. Um, but to see them outside in our green space, um, enjoying being physically active, enjoying nature, I think that was inspiring to teachers as well. And, and they've certainly bought into our active enrichment offer. I'm pretty confident that if we were allowed to invite parents to our active enrichment off, uh, offer, I, I think we'd get um, quite an influx. Yeah, absolutely. Loads more comments coming in. Little Al has said it's absolute travesty that children aren't being taught about climate and nature crisis. Gemma Goldenberger says we save more money doing this due to reduced need for mental health support in future and it's an investment and um uh josie fitz has said big push in scotland for outdoor play and learning especially in the early years so let me throw a question to all of you sort of on the panel here i mean what where do you think we should start what would be the most again if um as you know but i'm sure boris johnson and gavin williamson are watching so what would you say where, where to start in this issue how to what's the most important first thing to really get cracking I'll jump in then, shall I? Go on, Joe. Um, okay, coming from a, bit, from a bit of a climate perspective for me, COP26 is at the end of this year, or probably at the end of this year. It's a really great opportunity to show the great, show the countries, you know, what important climate policy can look like. Show them what we, what they ought to be doing. If the government right now announced it was going to review the way it teaches about climate change and nature, and the way that our schools work in relation to climate change and nature, then we would have a great opportunity to not just change our schools but also change schools across the whole world there are great campaigns working on this at an international level and it's really 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 important so hopefully we'll see some better commitments from the government in the next year and that will have a knock-on effect across the world so you're giving them what five six months warning to to make that announcement yeah yeah it, Count or else but yeah absolutely sounds good sounds good to me and of course the biodiversity cop the uh, that was going to happen in china in may has also now been moved to October. It's still, at the moment, it's still planned to happen in China, we'll see, but that's the UN Biodiversity Summit as well. So we've got that in October, and we've got the Climate Summit at the moment, scheduled to happen in November. It's possible both of those might move again, just a report on that today. But at the moment, that's happening in October, the Biodiversity One, Climate One here in the UK in Glasgow in November. So just as Joe says, great opportunity uh, for the for the for all the governments in the UK to step up their commitment to outdoor learning and uh, making sure that our education is is right for teaching around climate change and ecological crises ahead of October and November. Um, what about the rest of you? Where would you all start? Bobby, let me come to you. So I'm going to come uh, from, a, from a project angle because that's what um, my experience is in. So I would say more funding for the projects and specifically funding so that the projects can last longer than as um, Fiona said, like one, two, three years, sorry, it's my dog in the background, <laughs> um, one, two or three years, um, because I think it takes you all of those years to actually find the communities that you want to work in, build up that relationship with those young people, uh, with the people that you want to educate. And by the time that the project is ended, and um, that's when you're only beginning to see uh, that actual like beneficial 
um, results from your project. So only now, like in keeping it wild, after the two, three year mark, we can um, kind of get feedback from our participants and then change the um, the project accordingly. So it's uh, as beneficial to them as possible. So I would say, yeah, definitely longer um, funding periods. Niall, what's your sense of this? What would you, what would be the sort of big push to give to, to really take it to the next level? Yeah, I think on the back of what Bob was saying there, it is about funding. And I think about um, the nature premium that I've come across um, on social media channels. And I think Ring Fence funding, similar in respect of uh, the physical education premium, where there would be key indicators that the funding would have to be spent in line with. And obviously that would be completely ring fenced and schools had to would have to spend it directly um, on developing outdoor learning, um, education around nature. That, that would be... Uh, I think, a, a reasonable request. Yeah, well, there's a lot of comments coming in tonight about funding. We've got Schools Recycle Devon has said, we've lost funding in Devon over the years. Our council environmental education programme comes out of the waste budget. And we do a lot with very little money, but all the same, isn't it kind of crazy that it has to come out of the waste budget? Mike Wynne Stanley has said, it's surely essential that Nature Friendly Schools continues in order to produce the necessary evidence and best practice to encourage schools and decision makers to integrate nature-based learning. Well, Mike, I would completely agree. Uh, we've got funding for the next year for nature-friendly schools, but it's uncertain after that. So if Rishi Sunak's listening, you might want to think about how he can fund the wildlife trust to do future years of nature-friendly schools as well. It's very good return on your back, Rishi, honest, I promise you. Uh, so Fiona, what about you? How would you take it up to the next level? Uh, can I have two things? Yes. <laughs> So uh, my first would be is what we can do right now. So the government's talking about uh, COVID recovery. And again, Scottish governments, Welsh governments, Northern Irish governments, we're all looking at how we recover from this. So why not combine it with learning more about our natural world? And particularly if we're looking at catch-up lessons and funding for catch-up lessons over summer, use getting outside and learning about nature to do that even if you're doing maths even if you're doing english do it outside and use that catch-up funding to do that and i'd like to see the government coming out with really strong messages and support around this because they're very patchy at the moment and i think to me one of the biggest things we can do is um, get government to be more serious about teacher training and uh, a teacher training has become so fragmented over the, over the years. Um, at, at one point, it used to be easy to en enter into and, and get messages into um, all, all teachers. But we've, we've got new regional hubs being set up, 81 of them. And I think now is a really good time to look at where we can put in learning teaching about our natural world and about climate and our young people's future, where we can put that in. And I would say for both those things, um, let, let young people participate more, please. <laughs> they're more than capable. In fact, they're more, more capable than, than many of us. Please let them have the, the ways to participate properly um, to help in these decisions, any reviews, any decisions that are made least drawing young people with, with their know-how. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that theme, Charlotte Alchin has said, please can we see Joe and Bobby at COP26? Uh, <laughs> absolutely. I noticed no one's calling for myself or Niall or Fiona to be at COP26, <laughs> but it was fine. <laughs> absolutely fine. Um, okay, all. So just imagine, we've talked a lot about funding here, but imagine if funding wasn't a problem. Imagine if suddenly we, we could scale up the funding. What would be your biggest problem after that? I mean, you know, we, we've talked about how this is a no-brainer. It's got to happen. It's absolutely obvious. It's the right thing to be doing. Funding is the first obvious problem. But actually, you know, as practitioners, as people that have studied this closely, what are, what are the biggest challenges beyond funding to really uh, take it, uh, to really get it going? I mean, Niall, what would you be, say your experience of that would be? Again, I think we've implemented something Kind of similar. Um, in terms of the school development plan, I, I'm very lucky. We've got an incredibly supportive senior leadership team um, and a non-negotiable around physical activity um, is been implemented into that school development plan. So 
every teacher is expected to take their child out at least once a week from active learning. So obviously, by and large, that will be out in nature. But I think if other schools were to adopt a similar approach, and it's not like, not in terms of a, like a threatening fashion, it's like, you know, this is an expectation alongside other subjects that you're teaching. We want to see, you know, at least one less, if not more, obviously, but one lesson a week dedicated to uh, learning outside the classroom. And obviously, if we can we can build from there. I think one lesson a week would be a fantastic start. There may be classes that are already doing more than that, but you know, for those members of staff that are a little bit more tentative, that that would be something I'd suggest. Yeah, Lucy Lyle has said something similar. Nile on that said, my children return to school only to do weeks of tests, no recovery curriculum, or use of outdoor space their school has. So, as you say, just get it get it in there into the into the routine. Uh, Bobby, what would you say would be the biggest sort of challenges after funding? I'm going to have to say maybe trying changing people's mindsets towards how they see wildlife and how beneficial it is to them. I think um, maybe a lot of parents and young people don't actually realise how amazing it is to spend time outdoors, how good it can be for your mental health, for your well-being, for your physical health. Um, and I feel like when we kind of overcome those barriers, it will become less separate and more integrated in actual life and just becomes a norm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joe, Fiona, what would you say after funding, if we could wave a magic wand and funding is no longer a challenge? Yeah, from, from my point of view about getting climate change taught more in schools, um, I think there's obviously the issue with um, teachers or like, you know, what teachers are able to do. So there's like a lack of a lack of knowledge currently or lack of training currently, which needs to be fixed. There's also the fact that the teachers have a lot on their plates. So might not have the time to figure out how the climate change and sustainability environment can fit into their own subjects. My mum's a teacher. I know she's very, very busy all of the time. So there needs to be really good support from the government, not just financially, but also in the resources they give and the great training they give. With Teach the Future, we're asking for the creation of uh, a National Climate Information Institute that could kind of give out it would be a, you know amazing team of scientists and uh, educators who work together to create amazing resources and information that teachers and other groups can use to better understand climate change in the environment but i think that'll be really key to making sure that learnings are up to date and that kind of thing so that that would be a, an important next step as well fiona I like that idea. What Joe said. <laughs> no, uh, for me, oh, if, mon if money wasn't a barrier, um, I think we could do a lot around giving parents carers and young people skills um, and do more around where people actually live, work and play. So again, create nature spaces on people's doorsteps, create the corridors between your walk from home to school, have more green space in school. Because I think once that environment is around you, the access would happen naturally. Um, and I know here in the Wildlife Trust, we, we talk about a, a nature recovery network. So I would like to see that nature recovery network extended to include communities of people, parents, carers, governors, schools, uh, communities, community organisations, youth organisations coming together in local spaces and places and just in improving their locality and getting more nature in there uh, and doing it all in a green way, of course, and blue way. <laughs> And in that way, maybe it becomes a community recovery network as well. Alison McIntosh has said we do need a policy shift in education to embed climate literacy as a mandatory national curriculum subject, preferably embedded in all subjects or standalone. Then watch the funding flow. What about this? What do you all think about this debate about to what extent teaching and education around the climate ecological emergency to what extent should it be standalone and to what extent integrated across all subjects presumably there's pros and cons either way Niall I think I understand what you mean by by pros and cons I think that you know everything that we try to do at our school is, is very much cross-curricular that, that's that's the theme that's the way our children seem to learn the best and develop the knowledge the best so for me I would, I would personally go cross-curricular theme. Obviously, it lends itself 
very well to, to kind of science and geography. Um, we're quite lucky our science and geography leads uh, are really, really good at what they do. And I, I think that it'll be a discussion that I could be having. Um, I'm not sure they'll appreciate it, but I'll um, certainly be uh, looking to see how we could implement that at our school, what that would work for uh, our school, our, our community, I would say. Great. Joe, Bobby, particularly interested in your thoughts on this. Is to what extent in, integrated or uh, across all subjects? Or I'm quite strongly on the all subjects um, point of view. So, like, the, currently the way climate change is taught is it's pretty much just in geography. And the problem with that is it's an optional subject um, past, like, year nine or something. Um, and it means that not everyone is taught about climate change, but those that do also perceive it as just a geographer's issue and they understand it relates to all of them. I know it seems a bit stupid, but the way like our subjects are often like kind of framed in school is that like each subject is kind of preparing you for a different job area in a way. Um, and and when, particularly when it comes to the optional subjects that you pick at GCSE or A-level, it's kind of seen that's what you're going to go to then study at A-level and then that's what you're going to go and do your job in. So you... So people start thinking, oh, climate change only matters to people that are going to go and, you know, work in climate change. But more, in reality, climate change and environment matter to all of us. And I think that's a bit of the problem with the idea of like a standalone climate literacy subject or a standalone natural history GCSE. I think those kind of can in increasingly perpetuate the idea that climate change is like a separate silo. But actually, the way we understand it, the way it you know, relates to, to a world, it's actually it's embedded for everything. You know, the, the difficult thing about climate change to understand is that it's actually a threat multiplier. It, it makes existing threats worse. It kind of it, it sits on top of things that are already happening. And I think that kind of be similar to how we te teach about it too. It's it like in and around other subjects so that people can really understand how it relates to different parts of them. Also, different people learn in different ways. Some people learn through reading stories. Some people learn through, you know, maths and science. But having climate change or the environment in just one of those means that those are people that learn in different ways miss out on them. So I think it's really important it is cross-curricular. Thanks, Joe. Well, I mean, I'm a proud geographer myself, still consider myself as that. I normally think geography is the answer to everything, but I actually, you know, I very much agree with you on this. I think it has to be integrated. Uh, Bobby, what's your sense of this? Well, that was an amazing answer, Joe. Yeah. Um, I've got to agree with Joe that it should be integrated. Um, I can't, I can't remember, me personally, if I actually learned about climate change when I was at school I didn't do geography and I can't remember if I did um but I always remember something that my philosophy teacher told me and that was that everything um related to everything like not every subject was its standalone subject they all relate to each other in some kind of way and I think that's the way that we should approach um climate change as well integrate it to all of the subjects because it is relevant to everything is the world that we live in um and it should be approached that way so every, uh, so many of you in the chat are agreeing here. You've got Little Al, Julie Harrison, Asa McIntosh, Kathleen, all saying, yes, it needs to be integrated across the piece. But of course, that, uh, that that makes it even more of a challenge around teacher training, doesn't it, Fiona? It's like, you know, actually, we're talking here that this has to be covered in, in all teacher training, not just for geographers. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think certainly my experience of, of doing this outside with groups um, I think I was fortunate to, to be um, doing it at a time when we, we had really fantastic leads in local authorities. So we had arts leads, we had environmental education leads, and actually would work with those leads in authorities to help develop the teacher training that was, was sort of deemed as universal uh, and also built into CPD with whole school, school uh, teams as well. So there is a way to do that with school teams and integrate it in that way. Um, but I agree that, you know, to integrate right from um, sort of early years, right through to sort of tertiary education to find a thread, which is learning about our natural world and to find that thread and where, it, where the hooks are in every subject would be fantastic. And also creating time in the curriculum to allow that to happen. Now, at primary school level, it can be a little bit easier. Um, we can ask for those things we ask at the moment for at least an hour outside every day, and that can be easier. But the secondary curriculum is, is a bit more of a challenge. But other countries 
are, are looking at some solutions and, and, and an example of one is to give um, students 20% of their own time to follow something they want to follow, which is learning about climate, our planet, the natural world. And I think I'd be interested in looking at that and sort of giving a, a sort of learner-led approach as well. Um, and I think the other thing is um, about specific topics. And I know there's been a lot of conversation about the natural history GCSE. We actually support the Natural History GCSE at the Wildlife Trust. We don't see it as the only thing that should be happening, but it came from a naturalist, Mary Cowell. It had the most phenomenal response that almost any GCSE has seen. So over, over 2000 respondents, uh, 200 of those were young people. Uh, and it shows us a real interest in that. Um, that that proposal, that consultation was done by the examining board OCR and they've actually sent the proposal to the Department for Education at the moment. And there's, we're waiting to hear whether there'll be a wider consultation. And the reason that um, we think it's so important um, as well is one, it brings, it does bring the teaching of natural history and natural world and climate into one place. And to Joe's point about um, whether it's science or humanities and art and the way you might deliver that, again, it's not going to be a science and it's not going to be uh, an art subject or a humanities subject. It aims to bring things together in a very holistic way. And I think the key stage where you have a GCSE is so important, it's really vital. We already know from research that at the age of about 14, there's a real drop off in nature connection with teenagers. Obviously they're finding many more things to do <laughs> at that particular age. But if you were to have a dedicated subject to that age, I think it would make teenagers actually think about the natural world with it being a, a subject. And also uh, uh, I do think, you know, as part of the teaching of that natural history GCSE, if we can incorporate the how to teach, not just the what, it's not just about the subjects or the topics, it's how you teach it. How do you get connection with the natural world? What's that about? You know, it's not just about IDing things or being able to name things. So I think that will be crucial. So if it's done in the right way, I think it could provide a block for things to happen either side of the curriculum and certainly afterwards, if you studied that at GCSE level, it would really affect your choices for A level and then into workplace thinking. And I actually totally agree with Joe in that workplaces should be places where skills can be utilized and an understanding of our natural world, our place in, within it. You should be able to practice that in any job that you do shouldn't just be the realm of environmental jobs or what I like to call dig and do jobs. Um, it, it can be woven into any single job and maybe end up working for Rishi Sunak and change the whole of, you know, the way economy happens uh, for, for the Anatra world. Who knows? Okay, well, uh, Red Hen Kids has said, thank you for mentioning early years, Fiona. Uh, this is where the foundations are laid. Uh, we've also had a comment from Wild Dairy Name, who's uh, from Ireland, saying we are facing the same issues in Ireland. Congratulations to the panel. Very inspiring. Involved in outdoor coastal education here. Really see the positives amongst kids, teachers and parents. And Cheryl uh, McGeechan has said, uh, I work with university students and they are so passionate about learning more and differently about climate change. Love the activism of Teach the Future. So inspiring. Uh, and then we've also got local authorities from Alison McIntosh. Local authorities could help. I'm an environment education officer for Wigan Council, but lots of local authorities have um, uh, cut in, in completely in the last 10 years. Real problem there. Um, let me ask you uh, another question to the panel here. I mean, th th there's a danger that we kind of make an assumption here that sort of every school has access to green space. That this is easy for every school to do, but of course, for some schools, they don't have access to easy access to green space now. What needs to be done in those kind of circumstances? Um, Niall, can I kick you off? I'll let you kick us off first. 
Yeah, I think again with my experience with nature friendly schools, there you know there are many opportunities to look at developing the school space or, or greening of the school space. I've I've got colleagues in Bradford, in a city where they're looking at how how are they going to develop their site, and there are ways there are ways to do it for absolute certain. I also think that it's important to you know speak with your senior leaders because if you're passionate about something or you want to make something happen. There are resources out there and we have a plethora of uh, schools in Bradford that are absolutely incredible when it comes to their outdoor learning offer. And I think that that's what we've built up. We've built up a community in Bradford and in Leeds, um, you know, of schools that are willing to share best practice in terms of what they've done and, you know, what works well for their schools and that's inner city schools and schools with green space. So, you know, it's about sharing good practice and supporting colleagues in the community. Bobby, this must be a really big issue for you at the London Wildlife Trust. I mean, how do you tell us how you work with schools that don't have easy access to green space? Um, so we'll um we've worked with like youth clubs that would come to us and we can give um, them funding and they get transport to come to our wildlife trust sites. But it is a big challenge for schools that don't have any kind of green spaces near them. I went to a school in central London um, and that was a car park that's that's all we had for our kind of lunch times um and I think that possibly creating a space where you could create a garden and have a pond and have an area where the young people could actually plant their own wildlife that would be really amazing um I've seen my little sister who's eight her school actually has um like a wildlife garden in it and it is amazing and I can't believe that that actually exists and that is in central London and um, so definitely creating if there isn't a place that you can get to creating however small it is um a wildlife space and in, in the school and that's the thing it doesn't need to be that larger space mm. does it to make a big difference you know um, and, uh, you know, the comment that's been made here by Alison McIntosh says that Wiccan Council were looking at school grounds to naturalise. I've been staggered at the amount of green space some schools have, but only allow playtime on the tarmac playground because of being risk averse. And, uh, you know, I've noticed that sometimes schools actually can create a little bit of wildlife space in a, a bit of land, perhaps at the side of the car park or something like that, that they previously had just neglected and not really thought about. Um, uh, Joe, uh, Fiona, what, what's your sense of this, so particularly, you know, schools which have uh, find it harder to have access to green space? Have you got any further thoughts on that? Uh, one, of my th one of the things I used to do is um, I used to work with a lot of schools from the centre of Nottingham. Um, and even before they, they came out on a visit to Woodland, I would go into school and I would almost take nature with me. So I'd make sure I was debt as far as possible without damaging environments, of course, uh, take, take those into classrooms and spaces. And, and many schools were able to really easily see just from doing that, that they could turn window boxes into place to grow things. They could actually use part of their um, very small playing field, if you like, if they had any, or um, tarmacs, uh, area to dedicate it just to doing nature activities and that would be I don't know taking art frames outside making your own sculptures doing your own art getting that hook in a in a, in a quite uh, creative way if you like initially uh, but again I think um, being able to walk from school into other green and open spaces is crucial um, I mean, it's not only good for nature because nature needs, you know, wildlife needs to move around as well through these corridors. But, you know, if we could have um, ways, corridors, even to get to, I don't know, a canal, a riverside, uh, another park. And in those local parks, excuse me, <laughs> and in those local parks, um, have more have more nature there. Don't leave it to concrete play items. Introduce more nature in those. And I think... Um, play spaces in parks are a great place to start, you know, in, introduce natural play rather than play equipment. So again, that sort of link to play and socialising, make sure we, we do more on that. Yeah, and Joe, any, any thoughts on this, Oliver? I mean, I've always been really lucky to live in a very uh, green space. I live in Wiltshire, which is like a very um, green and very I guess, rural um, county. 
my house backs onto a nature reserve so like I've always had an abundance of nature around me and that's been so key to me growing up but I I you know I, I really couldn't live in a huge big city because because I just wouldn't say that to that it would be so weird uh, not being surrounded by trees but um I mean I think this is really important and I think just just interesting but my school actually well I know it's really more but what was my school has actually recently had to sell some of its field in Greenland because it just it just was running out of money and couldn't afford money to it couldn't afford to like m- maintain the school without selling land I just really don't think schools should be in a situation where they're having to get rid of green space so it can be developed on for housing you know making it so that students are more kind of like surrounded by, by, by buildings rather than green space. And I think that's a real scary step backwards. So we need to make sure that schools are being given enough funding for their buildings. They don't have to sell their land. Um, yeah, it's really sad. Okay, well, thanks. It's been uh, wonderful hearing from you all tonight. We've, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. So I'm going to come to each of you in turn and just ask you your kind of final thoughts. And uh, Asking the question that we had at the, the heading for tonight, we asked the question, is education failing our young people and the natural world? I think you're kind of all asking that, but what would you say has been the biggest hope you've, you've experienced to deal with that? Let me come to you first, uh, Fiona. Is education failing our young people and the natural world? And what would be your biggest hope to point in the right direction? Uh, I don't think it's completely failing, but I think it's very a very patchy picture and it needs to be more uniform and it needs to be universal and access to it needs to be universal and include everybody. Um, And what was the second question, sorry? (laughs) And what's been your sort of biggest hope to sort of for the future, if you like? My biggest hope is, has been um, something Joe said and, and hearing Bobby as well, is how we are seeing what young people can do and let let left to their own devices as well let young people take over i say <laughs> niall how how much do you think it's sort of failing generally at the moment perhaps not in your school or your yeah class, well generally. that's that's the thing i don't i really desperately don't want to to admit defeat so I, I know in my region i don't think it is failing but obviously i'm aware of the bigger picture and I think it is up to advocates. I know people were saying in the chat that it's, it's unfortunate it's one person that's kind of driving it, but I believe that every school needs that one person as the catalyst to, to start making things happen. And I think that um, my hope would be that, you know, particularly through social media, that schools, not just in our region, but across the UK, are seeing what we're doing in terms of dedicating time to outdoor learning and nature and, and hopefully get some inspiration from that and, and begin to develop their own offer great thanks Niall Joe what would you, you what would you say is your sort of biggest inspiration on this and uh, your, your overall assessment of where we are now I mean in my opinion we're not in a good place now um, so we've done a lot of research to teach the future I said earlier 70% of teachers don't feel adequately trained to teach on climate change in England 4% of students only 4% of students say they know a lot about the environment and climate change. Only 4%, and that's really horrifying. But I think we can make some great progress. There's great there's, there's progress that's happening in Scotland and Wales. Um, it's not quite the road we want it to happen, but we're working with those governments to, to get somewhere, which is really great. Um, so, so I think there is good, there is, there is hope. Um, I'm going to plug teach the future's petition really quickly but we've got a petition it's at 21,000 signatures and we're hoping to get 25,000 soon it's at teachthefuture.uk slash petition please go ahead and sign it and also write to your MPs and MSPs um, it'd be really really helpful if you could do that thank you I'm sure we can give that a boost boost on uh, Wildlife Trust social media in the next few days as well Joe we're happy to do that and Bobby uh, tell us what's your would be your overall assessment at the moment and what gives you the biggest hope I um, have to agree with Fiona. I think possibly that the education system at the moment is failing, but education as a whole, there are so many amazing projects and there's so much amazing work that I've experienced, I've found out about. um, So I can't say it's completely failing. Um, And I'd say the biggest hope is definitely the young people that I've worked with. They are absolutely amazing. Um, From young people that haven't really had any experience in nature and being so enthusiastic and wanting to bring their own kind of like flair and spark to it all the way to young people 
people that are younger than me and are kind of birders and are um, like species specialists. I think the young people are definitely what give me hope. And so there you have it. It's the end of term report come in, I think, and it's not quite an F. Uh, but it's definitely a need to improve. And actually, we're looking to help from the government to enable us to improve and to really make sure that education isn't failing young people and the natural world. You know, it is a thing, isn't it? If education is uh, really supposed to prepare the next generation for the future, then we have to ask ourselves as a question, is it just to prepare the next generation as worker ants for the uh, economy? which is a phrase that I heard once used, or is it actually to prepare the next generation to be an integral part of society and a part of society that is delivering on real progress for humanity, which surely is learning to live fairly within environmental limits. And as I said before, if you look at the young generation now, they know how to do it. They are already inspired, but just think what could be achieved if we gave that little bit of extra help in providing an education system that really, really supported our young people to be prepared for the future. They're not inheriting a great future from us older generations, uh, not as good as it should be. Uh, surely the best we could do now is really make sure they get the best possible education to help them for that future uh, that they uh, inherit. Thank you very much for joining Wild Live tonight. The next one will be in early May and it will be focused on environmental economics. We're putting the panel together now. So uh, look out for that and we will let you know soon what the date is once that's confirmed. I'm really looking forward to that discussion, which could be quite heated, I think, could be quite interesting and fun, uh, that one in early May. And uh, Please do share this on social media once it's uh, there on, on YouTube. Uh, share it out so that as many people watch this as possible. But as ever, thank you so much for watching tonight. Thank you for all the comments. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions. There's always so many more than we've got time for. But my big thanks, of course, goes to the panel, to Fiona Groves from the Wildlife Trust, to Joe Brindle from Teach the Future, from Bobby at London Wildlife Trust, from Neil O'Brien telling us about the amazing work he does in his outdoor classroom. And of course, to Dr. Amir Khan for joining us and helping us understand this issue tonight. Very much hope you've enjoyed it. Until next time, thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.